Good evening, everyone from Abu Dhabi. I'm Dr. Sadia Jamil from Khalifa University of Science and Technology. I would like to welcome you in the 16th episode of Communication Talk. And today we are going to talk about the role of media to combat COVID-19 pandemic. The novel coronavirus death has troublesome our life during the entire past 12 and more than 12 months until now. So we really need to talk about how many stakeholders and actors who are actually struggling to deal with the spread and control of COVID-19. So we have seen World Health Organization, we have seen governmental and non-governmental organizations tackling with the uh, preventative measures of COVID-19. But what journalists and media organizations in particular are doing, what academics are doing, um, in, in this particular situation to address challenging arising from the COVID-19 pandemic, we are all going to talk about in this episode of Communication Talk. Today, we have four distinguished experts from the field. We have Professor Nancy Jennings. She is the Director of Children Education and Entertainment Research from University of Cincinnati in Ohio. We have uh, Malik Manira, he is managing editor of iHub Online. We have Mahmoud Menon from Bangladesh, and he is um, uh, founder and the editor of agarpole.com. Sorry for the pronunciation, and he will reintroduce himself again. And we have uh, Miguel Pezina from uber.com, the observatory for communication. He is a researcher and a PhD candidate in Spain over there. So let me welcome all of our speakers and guests today. A very warm welcome to all of you in the 16th episode of Communication Talk. A brief hello to everyone. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are at your places. So let me begin today's episode with my first question to Miguel from Spain. Miguel, how do you see the overall situation of COVID-19 pandemic as a researcher? Now, we have progressed a lot until this stage of now we are having vaccination in many parts of the world. Um, how do you see, like, what are the transformation from the onset of COVID-19 pandemic and until now, now we are having, like, uh, pretty much secure measures uh, for traveling, for operating as a journalist, how do you see, how do you reflect upon the entire situation? Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, well, I think the the best way to describe the situation is, is that it, it is um, a situation that requires a permanent adaptation from everyone. Uh, one of the things we told our students at, uh, at Ishkte is that we're, we're actually living in a, a living laboratory right now. So, um, whatever we, we define as the new normal now may, may change rapidly. And so uh, we are in a, on a permanent adaptation mode. So it, it's really challenging, not just for, um, for us as researchers and professors, but also for our students uh, and for, for society overall. So um, I would say that the biggest challenge of, the, of this ever-evolving situation is actually the, um, this, this permanent adaptation state that we're living in. Uh, so, um, for, for, I am a researcher in media, so since March 2020, I've been monitoring the, the impact of COVID on media consumption and uh, the role of media on the fighting against the pandemic. And there, if, there have been some substantial changes in the, in the past year, almost a year now. Um, but I would say that the most, uh, the most um, dramatic trend we've seen was that at the beginning, at the onset of the pandemic, was that we were we were living on a 24-hour news cycle, almost as if we were living in a permanent breaking news uh, environment that. Uh, we spotted in our research a huge thirst for information. People were gathering around news media uh, to try to track the pandemic, to figure out what uh, what was happening, to to stay up to date to to all the events of the pandemic. Um, and we really were surprised by those numbers. The people were really messing around. Uh, with the news media to, to try to stay up to date. Uh, but then what we noticed is that after a short period, uh, we actually noticed that uh, the amount of attention that people played to media and to news media and to news overall uh, was actually stabilizing to pre-pandemic levels. Um, 
after uh, taking a closer look at what was happening, what we noticed was that we were witnessing an, uh, an actual saturation of news content because people were becoming too overwhelmed by the whole situation, by, by, by this permanent breaking news cycle that was happening in a 24-hour news cycle. So um, I would say that th that was the first phase of the of the pandemic uh, for the media is that they had to learn how to relate to their audiences and to the consumers in a new way in a new rhythm that would uh, first uh, inform people properly about what was happening but at the same time that would not promote a state of permanent saturation um, and uh, so um, I think it's it's more like um, an issue of quantity versus quality uh, it's not so much about the quantity of news you produce uh, about the 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 desire to be permanently producing news and producing content about the pandemic but it's more about how to be effective at communicating the pandemic at producing content relevant content that that will inform the people in an efficient way without saturating them so that was a really really um big leap since the beginning of the of the pandemic we are already witnessing this in portugal uh, and in spain uh, we noticed that the the media have adapted their strategies uh, to prevent this sort of saturation and uh, as such this has this has produced some really interesting effects in the way media relate to their audiences namely in the exploration of new formats um, what we see today is that uh, there are some really new strategies to approach content, namely through audio, for instance, and through video, but also through microblogging. Uh, microblogging was uh, was not initiated by the pandemic. Uh, those sort of uh, always up being updated uh, news coverage, uh, but uh, what we noticed with the pandemic is that they became really mainstream. Nowadays, everywhere you go, you always have a, a breaking news uh, sort of content in the main page with uh, permanent updates. So this really has allowed journalists to explore new ways to relate to their audiences and to keep people informed. So um, usually this sort of um, always up-to-date uh, pieces of content usually have a, a sort of brief at the beginning so that people can know what uh, what is happening what is happening doing during the, that day during that week so they they are always uh, being presented the most relevant pieces of information not just a, a huge spurt of information uh, in, in terms of quantity you know so um, this exploration of new formats is interesting because from the journals we've been talking about and from the the news brands we've been studying uh, we noticed that this exploration of new formats has actually been very efficient at fighting this saturation for news because it has allowed for a bigger adaptation to the desires of audiences to the way people consume you know so you you, you perhaps you can have a, a, a more brief approach to the breaking news but then you can uh, explore the situation uh, with more depth in other formats such as podcasting or video so it's it's a really interesting situation for the media because it is promoting a lot of innovation um, of course I'm not trying to to deny the the, the more negative aspects of the of the pandemic for media uh, mm -hmm. namely the the fact that media are struggling with their own issues also so mm -hmm. um, in, in the case of Portugal and Spain uh, and in terms and thinking of economic sustainability for media media projects uh, media were were um, were yet recovering from the effects of the 28 of, of the 2008 crisis uh, on the on their economic uh, sustainability strategies so uh, with the pandemic came a new threat to media and to independent media which is the fact that there were there, there was a, a really big uh, plunge in this in the in the sales numbers of uh, paper newspapers uh, or newspapers uh, at the same time, Portugal and Spain are not countries where people are very used to pay for digital news. So most news brands are still trying to figure out a way to monetize digital news content. Um, and there's another expert, of course, which is the practical work of the journalist, which is usually done in uh, in newsrooms, in a, in a physical environment. So all of a sudden, uh, they have to start working remotely. 
and um, and th this has caused a great impact in the in the daily life of journalists and the daily life of news. All right, because I have a question. So it is very much evident that there is a huge transformation in uh, news production and news distribution process and news consumption um, and consumers uh, pattern. So there is a very evident uh, transformation. But my question is like from a researcher perspective, do you see any new uh, theoretical lenses emerging um, in journalism or media studies, for example, we have like now notions of infodemic and disinfodemic, talking about the influx of disinformation, misinformation. Yes. Um, uh, so how do you briefly define the emergence of new theoretical approaches for journalism researchers and scholars? Yeah, I was getting to the topic of disinformation, <laughs> actually. So uh, I, I would say that on a second phase, uh, I think the, the biggest challenge for news media was actually uh, not only how to convey official information and, and trustworthy information properly, uh, on a second stage, the, the, they also tackled uh, or they also had to tackle the huge rise of disinformation. Um, and and, uh, and, and, when, I and when, when I speak of disinformation, uh, is also of the, um, not only of disinformation in general, but also of new forms of uh, of the way this information spreads, namely through social media and private messaging apps such as WhatsApp, which is in Portugal and Spain, there has been a huge rise in disinformation via WhatsApp, uh, such as audio clips, uh, video clips, etc. So just not text content that reaches a huge amount of people. So uh, I would say that um, on a second phase, that, that that was one of the biggest challenges because uh, journalists not only um, are uh, tasked with, uh, with a duty of informing people, of uh, providing trustworthy information, but also of trying to tackle um, the disinformation that is overflowing the networks and uh, reaching users at a very high pace. So uh, from a theoretical perspective, I think this, this is really interesting because, and this is um, uh, a discussion we've, we've had amongst ourselves, which is the fact that um, the pandemic has once again brought to light the, the purpose of journalism and, and the purpose of uh, journalistic coverage and how important it is to convey the news properly. Uh, so um, I think that one central issue here is the issue of trust. You know, uh, We are part of the digital, digital news report of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism and trust has been one of our key issues in the past few years. Uh, since the 2016 election in the USA, we've been focusing on the, on the polarization of news, uh, news environments, the polarization of society, political polarization, etc., and the impact this has on the trust on news media as a whole, uh, particularly when, when politicians or elected officials, officials target the media um, in their own uh, political uh, strife. So um, I would say that the issue of trust is now more central than ever, uh, not only because of the pre-existing conditions for the, um, f for the existence of less trust in journalism, but also because of the fact that this pandemic requires a huge literacy from journalists to convey complex issues, uh, technical issues, uh, scientific uh, uh, concepts that are not easy to handle and are not easy to convey in a simple way that everyone can understand. So I would say that from the point of from, the, from, from a theoretical point of view of the role of journalism and uh, how journalism behaves in such a, a polarized and aggressive environment even, I would say that the issue of trust and going back to the essentials of journalism and how journalists should behave and how um, should they uh, practice their, their professional conduct is, is really important. And I would add that um, along with the, with the issue of new formats I was mentioning, I would say that other um, secondary or parallel roles, such as the role of fact-checking, uh, uh, have become very central with this pandemic. So um, there, there, there's a double task here for journalism, journalists and for news media, which is not only do they have to convey the news and report the news, but they also have to um, uh, fight to 
to to mitigate misinformation and disinformation also, but also to to cross sources and to and to see if the information that is circulating is actually the best information and the most accurate information. So thank I would you, say thank you, Miguel. Um, that is right, the issue, so, central issue. Uh, yes. Uh, so we had uh, insights from Miguel, and we have definitely seen that there is a huge transformation in research agenda when talks about uh, in the COVID nineteen pandemic. It's all about transformation into news distribution, news production process how news consumers are acting during pandemic, how the market has been transforming. So there is a huge wide range of topics that are entering into journalism research these days. But we all need practical insights from the field, from the industry, from individual journalists based on their real life experiences. Mahmoud, we have um, you with us thank you for being with us can you please enlighten us about the real life challenges of journalists during the covid 19 pandemic that can actually help researchers to take into account um, and to enlighten all of us thank you so very much for uh, giving me the uh, floor and at the same time uh, thank you everybody for uh, joining this discussion and uh, this is really uh, something that we are discussing on and that, that is uh, very relevant for the time. And um, uh, from my uh, experience in the COVID period, this is just one year. Uh, I just, uh, today I was, uh, there is a, there is one uh, uh, talk show that I uh, host in uh, 2020 uh, on 18th April, which was uh, on some, uh, I was talking with a virologist in our country about the COVID-19, uh, when the COVID actually coming in uh, and the situation was not that dark that time uh, in Bangladesh, uh, um, as I would like to say. But uh, from that time, we have started talking on this. But uh, as I uh, saw, the whole um, one year of our journalism was uh, was distorted, was, was hurt, was uh, hampered in many different ways. Uh, that is, um, that is due to uh, what Miguel was telling about the disinformation, uh, etc. I will I will uh, focus on that later. But uh, initially, I would like to bring everybody uh, to one thing that this COVID nineteen when it came in, uh, it has first forwarded us to something uh, into something that um, uh, that we were supposed to be uh, uh, because the things were uh, actually the media were uh, facing some problem. Um, Am I am I loud and clear to you all? Uh, am I be audible? Yes, we audible? can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, I will see. You. Anyway, uh, so uh, actually, this uh, COVID nineteen has first forwarded us into that situation, and um, and the journalism itself uh, has uh, had to took uh, lots of lessons from this uh, COVID nineteen and for. Uh, from our day-to-day uh, -day activity uh, experience and from our other issues that which are financial issues, which is uh, many people has lost their job, etc. Those are very practical things that happened. And you uh, like um, the countries like Bangladesh is uh, yeah, uh, not that developed. So, uh, so the people uh, working in journalism arena, they are uh, they were so afraid of their. Uh, you were you were telling in your last words um, uh, that uh, journalists were facing uh, problems, like they were uh, they had to face the mis uh, uh, disinformation as well from uh, yeah, apart from the reporting. But in our country, uh, particularly, what I saw that uh, maybe that is um, uh, true from other countries as well that they were afraid of losing their jobs in the middle of, and many people got their termination later or discontinuation uh, uh, notes from the office in the middle of the pandemic. So uh, all this happened, but uh, if, uh, when the journalism is concerned, journalism doing reporting uh, on COVID-19, uh, as I saw uh, from the, for the whole year, um, the beginning days, you know, everybody were panicked and uh, journalists were, uh, were, were no different. Uh, I should say that uh, we are also panicked. Uh, for myself, uh, I was also I was also uh, um, uh, stuck myself in home uh, for some days, and after that uh, we started working from home. 
you know that came in uh, working from home and uh, when working from home is coming uh, is a concern that you need to have other facilities like internet connectivity etc uh, which is a big uh, um, issue here uh, all the time so working from home was not also that uh, easy and that smooth uh, then uh, when the uh, when the uh, when the pandemic is uh, uh, is fully uh, showing its face in the country and uh, in the world we are seeing that um, uh, that we cannot uh, cover all the thing uh, because uh, uh, there are some uh, issues like uh, well, if you are uh, getting the full information uh, or uh, there are some uh, points of uh, thing that you cannot trust on you cannot uh, you need to need to if you need to rely or if you need to do some uh, great reporting you need to go to the spot but you cannot but uh, from where you are getting the information that is also uh, uh, maybe is, uh, uh, partial information you are getting so we what we had to do during the pandemic that is a partial journalism i should say so we we couldn't do the, the whole thing uh, but uh, but at the same time there are many things happened but uh, opened up to us that is um, it was really really uh, that miguel was telling that it is really really 24 7 uh, uh, atmosphere and everybody were, were was wake up uh, wake uh, to get the information they are trying to get information from the other part of the yeah the, the covid 19 situation in america is was almost uh, same uh, important to uh, uh, covid to the readers of bangladesh because uh, they want to know about anything that is happening uh, anywhere in the world so uh, all the actually the proximity of journalism uh, that we uh, we talk about uh, was uh, was so bigger and all, almost 360 degree uh, proximity uh, issues uh, we saw during this pandemic and uh, every morning when we get some uh, uh, if you get some uh, updates from New York Times those are uh, you will always uh, uh, find that this yes this is important that we should publish it and if you get some uh, if, and I think that other countries were also aware of the, what is happening in Bangladesh what is happening in Kuwait what is happening in Singapore Mahmoud, is... I have a quick question from you so we are talking about the real life experiences of journalists what challenges they are facing in different contexts of the world and I'm very much sure they are facing from financial crisis to physical uh, risk to their safety including health safety and there are a lot of technical issues faced by journalists because many of them they are uh, confined and they are quarantined they have to work from home and a lot of issues are related to the fact checking or gatekeeping process that journalists have to tackle at a very individual level now the question remain is how do you reflect journalist training to handle this COVID-19 reporting which involves a lot of reporting on scientific knowledge to people in a very layman language so do you yeah. think uh, journalists are well prepared what universities need to do what media organizations need to do to train journalists and in a very short period of time because anyway we are in a living in a pandemic world and we don't have enough time so information is in a constant influx and how do you see the immediate need of journalist training to report on pandemic. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, actually, I, I was also to be there uh, in my discussion. That that is uh, what we saw in this time uh, in the pandemic. That uh, uh, the health reporting, you know, uh, which is not which is very weak and poor because of the learning. Because the uh, journalists don't know how to do it, how effectively you can do it and uh, on uh, actually you know uh, every public health issue there is a role of media every time when there is a public health issue because uh, there is a campaign issue or maybe awareness raising issue so journalists need to take their role every time when there is a public health issue and this pandemic has uh, shown us that we are not at all ready for this uh, type of journalism what we need to do uh, what we should do um, that way. and uh, and the uh, necessity of training etc the university should take over that how to uh, how to how they will be teaching their students about this issue uh, about the health journalism in particular i should say 
because um, uh, there I, I, we find uh, lots of the king in the journalism um, during this time about the health journalism in particular. Um, thank you, Mahmoud. Uh, thank you. Um, I will move forward to Malik, who is managing editor of iHub Online. Uh, Malik, can you hear me? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sadia. I can yeah, hear so you. My question yeah. is, so my question uh, is being a managing uh, being editor a managing of uh, an online media platform, how do you see um, operating a media business during pandemic? Like, what are the challenges within organization or within market? So how pandemic has affected or transformed media management and media operation overall? It's a, it's a very critical question. Um, it's a question that um, uh, we have to talk about uh, media management because um, it has been mentioned earlier on that um, uh, the, the pandemic has been disruptive not only uh, in one industry but uh, in, in uh, cross-cutting um, uh, manner. So uh, first and foremost, we have to understand the architecture of uh, the uh, media business. Uh, the media mostly thrives on um, uh, adverts uh, from the corporate world. So uh, when the corporate world has been hit hard by the COVID, uh, they will slow down. They will, uh, you know, because of the physical distancing issues, they will have to, you know, th there are certain sectors that may not operate from home per se, which means that uh, they might have to close shop. So as they close shop, uh, their revenue streams are shrinking. And um, as uh, their revenue streams shrink, they will end up, uh, you know, cutting on advertising spend. Now, when they cut on advertising spend, it means that um, the media, the, 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 li the lifeline uh, for the media is cut along the way. So, uh, for looking at it from the perspective of uh, adverts, you will see that um, uh, the media will really uh, face challenges in such a way that... Um, uh, media organizations not only in Malawi but across the globe have had to lay off their staff they have had to depend more on freelance uh, journalists who work uh, per article and uh, in a way uh, the media has really uh, been impacted uh, from a human resource point of view but also uh, journalists have uh, played the role of uh, the frontline workers so I, I am aware of uh, colleagues who have really uh, went down and uh, they, 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 they got the virus in the line of duty. Uh, that also uh, poses uh, a, a great challenge uh, to the profession uh, where they come in and uh, uh, play a, a leading role uh, in the front line and uh, when they get sick uh, or they, they stay away from home, in some cases they, they are rendered redundant and uh, uh, that also has uh, a, a implications at a family level. So uh, COVID-19 has had implications uh, on the prof profession uh, in its entirety, but also uh, when we look at uh, individual journalists uh, as well. So uh, COVID-19 has also uh, impacted on the way uh, journalists have to, to, to operate. Uh, for example, uh, every story uh, from the front page to the back page uh, from the political uh, story, uh, right now in Malawi there is um, uh, a story to do with uh, corruption. You know, the pandemic has brought in a lot of issues. Uh, for example, there has, the, the, the government has procurement regulations in place, but they have to be suspended due to the need to accelerate the processes for procurement. It has opened the can of worms in terms of corruption. So the narrative that has been shaped by the journalists uh, has been has had to be done at a supersonic speed, where journalists had really had to understand the dynamics and the implications of the COVID-19, but also uh, the civic education role. It seems that uh, th there are a lot of conflicting information, infodemic, as you put it on uh, earlier on. Uh, there is a lot of information, and journalists have to play a role of funneling this information and uh, putting it in uh, in the context where the the, the the stakeholders have to understand it. So it has also been a challenge because uh, even the discourse as it comes from the experts, it's not uh, always unified. It's it's really coming in theories and uh, 
uh, the theories in most cases are conflicting uh, on the vaccines for example when you have the debate of the efficacy it's really left or, or right so it's confusing to the journalist at the end of the day it's confusing to the to, to the audience so uh, the journalists really need to be equipped they need to be resourced so that uh, when they go out there with their information the information should be authentic and uh, it should help shape the narrative that uh, is appropriate and uh, add to the, to the discourse of um, uh, delivering information that is uh, correct and uh, not only correct but also that influences people to make uh, right decisions and decisions that will um, uh, make uh, people lead a healthy life but also uh, avoid uh, you know the risks associated with um, uh, COVID-19. So, All right, Manik, talking about uh, we are running short of time, uh, and I have uh, a quick have question a for you. Uh, so, from a, a perspective of media management, do you suggest like is there any space for emergence of new or alternative business models? Because now we have seen there is a huge decline in advertising revenue or overall revenue of media organizations, no matter in the print or electronic media. So, how do you see the emergence of new or alternative business models during pandemic? Uh, like uh, talking from experience, talking from experience, uh, uh, we really had uh, a tough experience because uh, our media institution is a startup. But uh, th there are alternatives. Um, for example, in our case, we have had uh, funding from the European Union through the international media support. Uh, they, 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 they offer, they are offering uh, COVID relief grants. Uh, it's something that um, uh, media institutions can really uh, depend on. But uh, over and above, you talked about uh, uh, the, 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 the possibility of uh, developing new business models. Uh, you know, the, 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 the COVID-19 has uh, had a positive effect, especially on the digital media aspect. So for those media institutions that would like to grow their digital platforms, uh, that's where now the business is transitioning towards. So uh, we have had that experience where we have seen uh, uh, we have diversified to, towards uh, the virtual space where we are um, assisting corporates and government agencies in uh, holding uh, virtual meetings. So basically we already had uh, live streaming capabilities. Now we've just transitioned those uh, streaming capabilities to assisting corporates as well as uh, government departments to stream or to, to, to hold their virtual meetings. Uh, so in so doing we, are, we have created a revenue stream out of that so it's something that can be replicated elsewhere and uh, it comes of course with the, its own challenges in terms of um, uh, are you able to, to to sustain your independence should you work with uh, with government it's something I think that uh, depends on your policy and uh, your position if government were to give you business today are you going to criticize the same government well our position is that uh, you give us business we do with you on business terms uh, but uh, when it comes to us uh, uh, working or doing our work, if it is about criticizing, we are going to criticize you. Uh, we are going to criticize you without looking at uh, the business that you have given us. So if you can reach that compromise, then well and good. But uh, if you may not be able to, to, to reach that position, then it may be a challenge. But uh, there are uh, opportunities that are being presented uh, by the COVID-19 uh, as well, especially in the digital space. Thank you, Malik. Thank you, Malik. And now we are heading to our heading the final discount of this program. Professor Nancy Jennings, she's director of uh, Children, Education and Entertainment Research at University of Cincinnati in Ohio. Very warm welcome to Professor Nancy Jennings. I would like you to address the role of media as an institution um, amid COVID-19 pandemic. And we really want an academic perspective from you. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for having me. And and I do really appreciate uh, the the panel panelists today because I feel like they really inform uh, some of the research findings that we've been able to 
um, acquire over the past, uh, few, uh, well, year, year I suppose. Um, and uh, so I, I really wanted to address uh, from an academic perspective, how we've been really thinking about all this different media use by different consumers. Um, and one thing that really seems to be coming out is that individuals are using media in lots of different ways um, to support uh, lots of different types of functions within the media. So um, they're uh, not, I'm sorry, not within the media, but within their own lives. So they're, uh, and so I've done quite a bit of research with um, some colleagues from around the world, and we've been looking at how teens and tweens in particular are, are focusing on their uses of uh, media and um, what what we're starting to find um, is that, you know, there's this double-edged sword of, um, we know they're using media far more than, than under pre-pandemic conditions. Um, Pre-pandemic, uh, they may be, you know, three or four hours um, for entertainment uses outside of school uh, per day, but as, as, the pandemic has progressed. They're using it for all diff all kinds of things. They're using it for education. They're using it for their schooling. They're using it to stay connected with other people. So um, we've uh, so we've got this background too of um, concerns about um, their o their over overuse in general, um, and then uh, now you just pile on top of that all this other other use as well. So um, we have seen um, what they call the COVID effect. Uh, Cusidio, um in 2020 identified a COVID effect. Um, so there's over 130% increase in use of entertainment and social apps, 30% uh, increase in video games, a 50% increase in educational apps for children between the ages of uh, four and 15. Um, and that really, is, um, we're really finding that with um, our own research as well. Um, and if we're, if I kind of break it down into three different areas, uh, one would be looking at the news themselves. So um, we're finding that teens and tweens are avoiding, um, some are avoiding the news. Uh, but they're more likely to complain about uh, misinformation. And so that really brings into question um, what was discussed in the panel, uh, because not only is it that there there's uh, conflicting information uh, that the journalists may be receiving, they may be having a hard time explaining it to other individuals, but then also um, the, the news sources themselves uh, may take a different spin. So if we're looking at from a framing perspective, um, the the different uh, media outlets may be taking a different perspective on it. So um, so those are some interesting uh, perspectives uh, to think about it, <laughs> uh, which, uh, which I'm delighted that this panel has been able to bring forward. Um, so it, it, what's important though, is that the, the, the even the teens and the tweens are noticing this, this misinformation. Um, and in the US, there aren't um, a lot of uh, resources for them to be able to find news that's not, that's directed towards uh, teens and tweens. Um, so, it, so that would be um, something that I would recommend in terms of um, uh, future projects for, for kids. Um, from an academic perspective to previous research, which suggests that um, for general media use patterns, um, we den generally find differences in gender. So oftentimes uh, the tween boys um, and teen boys are, are doing more video games and the girls are watching videos and using social media. That trend seems to have continued um, throughout, uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, and we're also seeing younger kids getting social media accounts. So pre-pandemic, um, the um, it was more 13 and 14 year olds that were getting um, getting this content uh, or getting social media accounts. Now we're seeing kids as young as nine and ten um, getting social media accounts. And part of the reasoning we're we're thinking about that is in terms of the theoretical perspectives. So um, so resilience and recovery. Uh, it's really important to think about all the different functions that media serve. It's not just a uh, uh, one size fits all and that it's all um, damaging to the children, but rather it's it's supporting. It's their, you, they're turning to the media to cope um, with their stress, with their anxieties um, and for escapism. So I, I would caution us to really think about how people are using media 
um, from, from an academic perspective and think about uh, uses and gratifications, think about resilience, think about coping strategies, uh, mood management and um, entertainment regulation, um, as well as media addiction um, and problematic use, I feel like that's less uh, of important right now as, as, uh, as we focus more on the stress and coping and the mood management and regulation. Nancy, so can we conclude that uh, if we say that COVID-19 pandemic has transformed journalistic practice, it has transformed media management models and uh, market regulations and operations in that way, it has already transformed users and gratification of news consumers. Is that correct? I would, I would say so. Yes, definitely. All right. So um, we will wrap off episode 16 of Communication Talk. And today we talked about the role of media to combat COVID-19 pandemic. I'm very grateful to all four discussants who participated um, today in this program and enlighten us with their uh, different perspectives. Thank you, all of you, uh, Miguel, Malik, Nancy, and Mahmoud, to join us in this episode. And before I leave, I wish you all a very good health safety at your respective places take care and goodbye thank you thank you, thank you. bye bye